Today's lesson is written in the book of 1 John, reading chapter 2. My dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. If someone claims, I know God, but doesn't obey God's commandments, that person is a liar and is not living in the truth. But those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. That is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment, to love one another, is the same message you heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment, and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing, and the true light is already shining. If anyone claims, I am living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light, and does not cause others to stumble. But anyone who hates a fellow believer is still living and walking in darkness. Such a person does not know the way to go, having been blinded by the darkness. I am writing to you who are God's children, because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. I am writing to you who are mature in the faith, because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I am writing to you who are young in the faith, because you have won your battle with the evil one. I have written to you who are God's children, because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith, because you know Christ, who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith, because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts, and you have won your battle with the evil one. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Dear children, the last hour is here. You have heard that the Antichrist is coming, and already many such Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that the last hour has come. These people left our churches, but they never really belonged with us. Otherwise, they would have stayed with us. When they left, it proved that they did not belong with us. But you are not like that, for the Holy One has given you his spirit, and all of you know the truth. So I am writing to you, not because you don't know the truth, but because you know the difference between truth and lies. And who is a liar? Anyone who says that Jesus is not the Christ. Anyone who denies the Father and the Son is an antichrist. Anyone who denies the Son doesn't have the Father either. But anyone who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So you must remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. If you do, you will remain in fellowship with the Son and with the Father. 
and this fellowship we enjoy, the eternal life he promised us. I am writing these things to warn you about those who want to lead you astray. But you have received the Holy Spirit, and he lives within you, so you don't need anyone to teach you what is true. For the Spirit teaches you everything you need to know, and what he teaches is true. It is not a lie. So just as he taught you, remain in fellowship with Christ. And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be full of courage and not shrink back from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Greetings, everyone, in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Um, today we heard Susan, that's my better half, read chapter 2 of John's first letter. And to be honest with you, there's a lot going on here. Actually, when I asked Susan to read today, um, she said, the whole chapter? <laughs> I said, yes, the whole chapter. She said, there's a lot going on in that chapter. I said, I know. And there's a lot to unpack, and we're going to do, uh, do a, a close look at this chapter. But when you listen to it carefully to the Spirit's leading, you really get the sense that Jesus is inviting us to walk in obedience to the truth. And John goes into detail of what that looks like in the life of a Christian who is walking in the light. And so today I just want us to take a few minutes to listen to Jesus speaking to us and look closely at what it means to walk in his truth. Let's take a moment to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for your word. We're thankful for your word made flesh in your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to spend time in your word and to learn from you and to walk with you. And so God, would you quiet in us any voice but your own in the name of Jesus Christ, that we may hear you speaking clearly to us, a word of encouragement and hope. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So John begins this second chapter by stating why he is writing it. And the bottom line is, he doesn't want any of us to fall into sin because as we saw last week in chapter one, we deceive ourselves if we claim to be walking in the light, in fellowship with Christ, communing with God, and yet are engaged in a life of sin. So he says in verse one, my dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. And his heart's desire is that, is that we would be one with Christ as he was one with Christ. And the, he's acknowledging that the critical stumbling block to walking in obedience to the truth is sin. Unconfessed sin separates us from God the Father. And I stress this because John quickly points out that we have the assurance of an advocate to speak on our behalf. He is the Christ. He is Jesus. And he is our advocate who speaks on behalf of the penitent child of God. And he reminds us, but if anyone does sin, and we saw last week in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, we all sin and fall short of God's glorious standard. That we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father, and he is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of all the world. And this is truly great news, friends, and, and a promise that we can claim for ourselves as Christians, as followers of Christ. 
And it is the hope that we proclaim to those who do not know Jesus. We have an advocate in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who is able to and indeed does intercede on our behalf before our Heavenly Father's throne. And John gives us the ways and means by which we can walk in the truth with Jesus in verse 3 when he says, and we can be sure that we know him if we obey his commandments. You see, a lot of people confuse Christianity with religion. Christianity is really more about a relationship than anything else. Religion is a bunch of rules and regulations that have to be followed. The Pharisees were religious and they held people to a religious standard of, I believe the number is 613 rules and regulations that had to be followed to be considered a faithful uh, person of God. But Christianity is, and, and what Christ offers us, and what he, he did for us on the cross at Calvary, was gave us the opportunity to, to not be bound to a set of rules, but actually to have an intimate relationship with him and with our Heavenly Father. And that relationship is about knowing God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and being in an intimate and loving relationship with Him, and having a desire in our hearts to actually commune with Him daily. And that's what John is getting at here. The key to knowing Jesus intimately is realized when we walk in obedience in his truth. There was an excellent book written by Charles Sheldon titled In His Steps. Maybe some of you read it. And, and there was a subsequent book written, uh, a contemporary version, uh, written by his great-grandson, Garrett Sheldon, titled What Would Jesus Do? And it came out you probably remember that that movement back in the in the 80s and 90s, the the WWJD movement. Maybe some of you had the wristbands that said WWJD on them. I did. I think I still have mine. And um, the, the the premise of of his book, Sheldon's book, was if we are walking in Jesus' truth, then our default position if you will, is to walk in his steps. To do what Jesus would do, or at least ask the question, what would Jesus do in this situation? And, and what that reflects is that the desire of our hearts wants to be one with Jesus and to be in step with him. And that comes from having an intimate relationship with him where we know him and he knows us. John says in verse 6, those who say they live in, in God should live their lives as Jesus did. Now, How did Jesus do that? Well, he loved one another just as the Father loved him. And John then reminds us of the commandment Jesus gave us to live by and correctly states that it is not new. What's new is that it is the outward evidence of the inward relationship with, that we have with Jesus that enables us to walk in the light, to walk in the truth, to reflect his love and grace. Look with me at, at verses 7 and 8. And this is how John, John puts it. He says, Dear friends, I am not writing a new commandment for you. Rather, it is an old one you have had from the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another is the same message you heard before. Yet it is also new. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment 
and you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the light is already shining. So we have this, ex this example set by Jesus to follow. And, and friends, I want to pause here for, for a moment and tell you just how much Susan and I have not only appreciated, but also been blown away by the love and the support and encouragement that you as a fellowship of believers, the, the, the family of God here at Queensway, have shown us as we have settled in here in, in, uh, in Niagara Falls. You can see I'm not from here yet because I haven't quite gotten accustomed to saying the falls. That's, that's how you can tell when somebody's from here or not from here. <laughs> I learned, I've learned that everywhere I lived. Um, but you, you've actually been living out the gospel, what John is teaching us here, in real and tangible ways with your love for us and, and your support for us and for one another and your care for one another. And you've demonstrated it in so many, so many uh, encouraging ways. And quite frankly, Susan and I have, have been involved in, in many churches in our lives. And, and we have been really taken aback and encouraged by, by how we have witnessed you living out your faith in Christ in real and tangible ways walking in obedience to the truth. And when we walk in obedience to the truth, we are walking in the truth of God's word made flesh, Jesus Christ. And we bring glory to God when the light shines brightly through us. And it doesn't have to be hard, friends. And that's what's been so encouraging here. Nothing that, that, that any of you have done to, to extend the love and kindness of Christ to us has been, um, you know, magnificent or, or, or you know, enormous. It, just little acts of kindness have just been so special. And there are simple yet effective ways of reflecting the truth of Scripture without beating people over the head with a Bible. And I have to say, I was so encouraged by the message Judy and Claude put on the sign this week, and, and it was very fitting for our message today. And I, I don't know if you, you all saw it, but it said, a word of love makes a world of difference. A world of love makes a world of difference. And that is so true, friends. There is such a great need in our world today for true Christ-like love, sacrificial love, which doesn't expect anything in return. It's just doing what Jesus would do. And Jesus, as, jo as John points out, lived the very commandment he gave us to follow. He loved the unlovable. He loved those whom the religious authorities, the Pharisees and Sadducees condemned, sinners like you and like me. He ministered to the outcasts and the marginalized and the oppressed because he was demonstrating for his disciples and for us a more excellent way, the way of love, his way of love, walking in his truth, the truth. And John reminds us again that if we claim to be living in the light but harbor hatred in our hearts, we're deceiving ourselves and, and, are, and are actually walking in the darkness. He says in verse 9, If anyone claims I am living in the light but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. And sadly, friends, there are a lot of Christians who are living in darkness because of the bitter root of hatred that they have allowed to grow within their hearts over the years. And the truth is, Jesus does not desire this for any of us. 
And indeed, we'll remove it if we come to him in humility and ask him to remove it. To cleanse us from all the bitterness and hatred we have stored up in our hearts. And friends, I know this from personal experience, from first-hand experience. And, and I know the freedom that I received when I was released from that bondage of hatred and was bathed in the cleansing, glorious light from Christ. that literally transformed me as a person and as a Christian. And that, that bitter root was removed and I was freed. And my desire is, is, is for that to be everyone's experience. Because it makes a difference. Because as when I was transformed by, by Christ's cleansing, I was no longer walked in the darkness, but now I was walking in the light. And I, I've been a Christian all my life. I was one of these people that John referred to. I believed that I was walking in the light because I was a Christian, but I was actually deceiving myself. I was actually walking in the darkness because I had this bitter root of hatred within me. And when it was removed, when I was released from the bondage of that, when I was set free from that and was bathed in his light, all of a sudden I came out of the darkness into the light. And it's a far better place to be, I can tell you, honestly. And so as a result, you will very rarely hear me use the word hate. I've, I've, I've virtually eradicated it from my vocabulary. I don't hate people. I may dislike them. I may not agree with them. I might find, I might find them incredibly irritating sometimes. Um, just ask Susan when we're out in the car driving. Uh, but I don't hate because Christ removed hatred from my from my body, from my spirit, from my soul. And so I don't have that vocabulary. But I, I, I have to be clear here. Not everybody was happy about this transformation that took place in me, most especially Satan. Because that's one of Satan's tools, is to keep us in bondage to hatred and to keep us in the dark. And he was none too happy when Jesus set me free from that bondage. And as we saw last week and again, John's telling us this week, Jesus doesn't just do this. We need to come to him in humility and ask him. And so John continues with this interesting conclusion to this section in verses 12 to 14 when he says I am writing to you who are God's children because you your sins have been forgiven through Jesus I am writing to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning I am writing to you who are young in the faith because you have won your battle with the evil one I have written to you who are God's children because you know the Father. I have written to you who are mature in the faith because you know Christ who existed from the beginning. I have written to you who are young in the faith because you are strong. God's word lives in your hearts and you have won your battle with the evil one. This list that John gives us here pretty much covers everyone, young and old, new to the faith and those who are mature in their faith and everyone in between. And he's saying to each one of us, pay attention lest you think you too highly of yourself. 
The Apostle Paul warns us of this in Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given us. So why does John do this? Why does John give us this list of of people that he's writing to? Well, I believe because he is preparing us for his message, which comes next, about the world and its trappings and warnings about antichrists. Because none of us are, are beyond falling into the trappings of this world or being led astray. So he says in verse 15, Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. Now, John's not saying we have to hate the world, nor is he saying that the world in and of itself is evil. And you'll hear a lot of people say that you know, technology is, is the work of Satan. And, and that we, you know, if we are truly following Christ, we should have nothing to do with technology. Well, I don't believe that. I believe that God has, has blessed each generation with, with gifts that have helped us to, to function well and to grow deeper in our relationship with him. Technology has allowed people to have online Bibles so that they can spend time in God's Word without carrying one of these around, which in certain parts of the world, if you were caught carrying a Bible like this, uh, you would be persecuted and, and quite, quite likely killed for it. Um, so technology has been a gift. So it's not, the, it's not the world itself that is evil, it's the love of the world. And the problem for John is when we love the world and all its trappings more than we love God, if we would rather have the things of this world than an intimate relationship with Jesus, when we get our spiritual encouragement from Oprah rather than the Holy Spirit and the truth of God's word, then we cease to walk in the truth. Paul says, just prior to that passage we read from Romans chapter 12, he says in verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. There's no question that the world has shaped us to a certain extent as a people today. We are a very different people group than than our ancestors were. But God's word has not changed. And Jesus' message and commandment to us has not changed. And God's will for us is to walk in his truth in his light and to know his love and peace which is poured out abundantly for all who seek to walk humbly with him. And the truth of the matter is anything that that we may do to conform to the world will surely fade. And you know, I go back to the example of technology again. Anybody who has an iPad that's more than about three years old knows that it is fading. Um, <laughs> it, it does not function uh, as quickly or as well as it did when it was brand new. It seems to be the case with all technology. It fades away. But none of that matters to God. What truly matters to God is our hearts. 
And when our hearts are one with him, that's an eternal thing, and it will never fade away. It will never go away. Our hearts are the key. And I love how, how the Old Testament puts it in the, in the story of the anointing of King David in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and just gives us a sense of, of what, God, what matters to God most and what matters to, to man. And in verse 16 we read, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. He had, God had rejected Jesse, who was a very uh, strong, uh, tall, good-looking son, and, of, and Samuel thought, surely this is the, the, anoint, the one that, that God wants me to anoint as the future king. But he wasn't. And, and it goes on and says, the Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Our hearts truly matter to God, not what we wear or what our hair looks like or whether we're clean shaven or not. God wants to know that our hearts are one with him. So in a nutshell, the things of the world will fade away, but a loving relationship with God will live on for eternity and is far more precious than anything the world has to offer. And the good news for us is we have access to him 24-7. We have access to our Heavenly Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit, 24-7. We don't have to wait for, for a good signal to get a hold of Him. We can access Him anywhere we are. John says in verse 17, he says, And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does, not, does what pleases God will live for, forever. Don't, don't miss that little sentence. Anyone, that is you and me, when we do what pleases God, that is walk in obedience in his truth, spend time communing with him every day, when we do that, we have this assurance that we will live forever, for eternity. The promise of eternal life is his glorious presence. And that is a precious promise we can cling to. So John then shifts his attention a bit here into the issue of false teachers and, and whom he refers to as antichrists. And he makes a valid point. We have Holy Spirit abiding in us. As born-again believers in the risen Christ, the Holy Spirit has taken up residence in us. Indeed, Scripture tells us that, that, that our bodies, we, our souls, we are the temple, temples of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, the truth is in us. However, if we deny that Jesus is the Christ, then the truth is not in us. And Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 33, everyone who denies me on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. And this, this person, John would say, would be an antichrist. And we need to acknowledge the truth that there are still many in our world today, some even in our Christian churches, who would deny the divinity of Jesus. They say that he's a good man and a healer and a prophet, even a gentle teacher, but the Messiah, the Christ? No, they can't, they can't go there. And I've even met supposed believers who don't believe in the virgin birth. Now, I'm not gonna suggest that they're antichrists, but 
John is pretty clear that to accept Jesus' invitation to walk in his truth means we need to be fully committed to our faith and trust in the resurrected Christ. And he says in verse 26 that he's writing these things to warn us so that we may be aware of those who might try to lead us astray. And without naming any names, you're no doubt aware, as am I, that there are many false teachers who teach and profess things that are not of God and not found in his word. And it has always been the case, which is why John wrote in, verse, in chapter 4, verse 1, which we'll get to in a couple of weeks, but I'd be remiss if I didn't share this now. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And one of the things that I find absolutely um, startling and encouraging about God's word is the fact that, that even though John wrote this in the first century, it's still speaking to us today. It's still the truth today. And we need to be vigilant in testing the spirits to see if they line up with what Scripture says and if they are consistent with the will of God. So John finishes this chapter with a word of encouragement found in verses 28 to 29. He says, And now, dear children, remain in fellowship with Christ so that when he returns, you will be of uh, be full of courage and not shrink back from, his, from him in shame. Since we know that Christ is righteous, we also know that all who do what is right are God's children. Jesus is the righteous one of God whom God has given us to walk with, to lean on, to learn from, to model our lives by, that we may grow more and more in his likeness as we grow deeper in our relationship with him. And God does not require perfection from us. Nowhere in, in John's letter, indeed nowhere in scripture, do you find God requiring perfection from us. He just desires a humble and sincere heart that is seeking after his heart and desires to walk with him daily in obedience to his truth, revealed to us in and through his son, Jesus. And we don't know the day or the time of Jesus' return. None of us do. In fact, even Jesus said, I do not know the day that the, Lord, that the Father has set for my return. But we do need to be ready at all times for his return. That he will find us walking in his light and in his truth, which he had, has invited us to do. That Jesus doesn't come back and find us engaged in some activity or some practice that is inconsistent with his truth. That we would be ashamed of. For him to see. And the reality is when we fix our eyes on Jesus daily, sin has no desire for us. And we don't crave the things of this world, but only a deeper relationship with him. Friends, one of my favorite stories in the Gospels is the Emmaus Road passage in the 24th chapter of Luke where Jesus comes alongside two of his disciples who are on their way home following the traumatic events in Jerusalem on Good Friday and then the news of Jesus' resurrection. And they didn't understand why these things had to happen, nor did they comprehend the whole significance of Jesus' resurrection. But Jesus loved them. And he took the time to, spend, to open the scriptures up to them to the point where their hearts burned within them. 
so they could make sense of it all and understand the truth. So they could walk in the truth. And that's what Jesus is offering us today. We don't have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. None of us do. Nor do we fully understand everything that Scripture has to say. But we have Holy Spirit to guide us into a deeper understanding, a deeper knowing of the one who is eternal life. And he is just waiting for us to ask him to open up the scriptures for us so that we may know more fully the one who knows us completely. So friends, remain in fellowship with Christ daily. He is the source of life in all its fullness. Indeed, he is the way, the truth, and the life. He is eternal life for all who place their trust, their faith, their lives in him. And as John proclaimed in this chapter, the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining in and through those who have surrendered themselves to Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. To him be all glory and praise, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you acknowledging that we don't understand the fullness of your truth. We thank you for your word, your holy scriptures, and for your son, the word made flesh. Lord, that through your word and through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and through the teaching of your son, Jesus Christ, Lord, that we may move towards a deeper understanding of your love and your grace, your compassion, your forgiveness, your holiness. And so, Father, we thank you for this time together as we have delved into your word today. We pray, O oh God, that, that you will use this time as a, as a blessing to those who have, who have been present, Lord, and and have heard your voice speaking to them. And I just pray, O oh God, that each one of us will, will take some quiet moments just to search ourselves, Lord, and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal anything to us that, that may be out of sync with your word, your truth. That we may confess it, that we may lay it at the foot of the cross and that we may humbly ask you to cleanse us from it. Lord, the desire of our heart is to walk humbly with you. The desire of our heart is to be one with you. So Lord, we thank you for your presence among us this day. And we pray, O oh God, that you will continue to place your hand of, of favor upon us. We pray that you will shine your face before us. We pray that you will guide us and direct our steps as we seek to walk in your truth, in obedience to your truth, each and every day, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Lord, we ask all of these things in his mighty and precious name. Amen. This doxology is from, from Jude. It's possibly a familiar one to you, but it, uh, it's one that has spoken to me over the years, and, and so I share it with you. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all times and now and forever. Amen. Friends, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. And all God's people said together, Amen. Amen. Blessings all.